system. And uh, to get a target accepted uh, takes quite a bit of work and expertise. And uh, a target has been designed and we presented later uh, for the district of Martha's Vineyard, as opposed to the county of Dukes County. So our impression is that uh, anyone who feels that they would like to wear it uh, may. Declaration of our growth. 
And um, many, many organizations were involved in making the observance of Tart there in April 6 a success. Clan societies, clubs, and fraternal organizations, and individual Scots Americans representing literally millions of Americans nationwide that participated. They include the Scots Charitable Society, the St. Andrew Society in Charleston, the St. Andrew Society of New York, the Scottish Society of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, the American Scottish Foundation Incorporated, the Association of Scottish Games and Festivals, the Caledonian Foundation, the Clans of Scotland, Council of Scottish Clans and Associations, Scottish Heritage USA, Illinois St. Andrew Society, Tartan Education and Cultural Association, Highland Light Society, Massachusetts, and the Scottish Historic and Research Society of Delaware Valley PA. And I'm going to read again. And the Scottish Society of Martha's Vineyard, Mass. Right up in there in the uh, congressional record. Mr. President, I am proud to declare my Scottish American ancestry, and it is an honor to recognize the 677th anniversary of the, de of the Declaration of our birth. Time day is indeed a significant day for all Americans. That was in 1977. Nice. Now in 1998, March 20th, in the Senate of the United States, 105th Congress, Congress, the 20th session. It's not Scotch, it's clear. <laughs> Whereas, April 6th has a special significance for all Americans, and especially those Americans of Scottish descent, because the Declaration of Arbroath, the Scottish Declaration of Independence, was signed on April 6th, 1320, and the American Declaration of Independence was modeled on that inspirational document. Whereas, this resolution honors the major role that Scottish Americans played in the founding of this nation, such as the fact that almost half of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were of Scottish descent. The governors in nine of the original 13 states were of Scottish ancestry. Scottish Americans successfully helped shape this country in its formative years and guide this nation through its most troubled times. Whereas, this res resolution recognizes the monumental achievements and invaluable contributions made by Scottish Americans that have led to America's preeminence in the fields of science, technology, medicine, government, politics, economics, architecture, literature, media, and visual and performing arts. Whereas, this resolution commends the more than 200 organizations throughout the United States that honor Scottish heritage, tradition, and culture, representing the hundreds of thousands of Americans of Scottish descent residing in every state who have already made the observance of Tarp Day on April 6th a success and whereas these numerous individuals, clan societies, clubs, and fraternal organizations do not let the great contributions of the Scottish people go unnoticed. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Senate designates April 6th of each year as National Tartan Day. And that was in 98. And it took a while for the House to get to it, but and I'm not going to read it because it's a copy. The Senate's uh, version. Whereas, 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 and this is National Time of Day, House Resolution 41, U.S. House of Representatives, resolved that it, that it is the sense of the House of Representatives that a day should be established as National Time of Day to recognize the outstanding achievements and contributions made by Scottish Americans to the United States. And that was passed, U.S. House of Representatives, on March 9th. 2005, seven years later, by unanimous vote. Unanimous. It was unanimous, yeah. Okay, now um, I'm going to give you a little brief history of the Declaration of Our Growth in case someone's unfamiliar with it. I didn't know too much about it until fairly recently. Uh, but it is considered to be um, the model for our Declaration of Independence, written many, many years before. And um, it's a declaration of the Scottish independence, made in 1320. It is in the form of a letter submitted to Pope John the 22nd, dated the 6th of April, 1320. It's intended to confirm Scotland's status as an independent sovereign state 
and defending Scotland's right to use military action when unjustly attacked. And the declaration was part of a broader diplomatic campaign which sought to assert Scotland's position as a kingdom rather than being a feudal land controlled by England's Norman kings, as well as lift the excommunication of Robert de Bruce. He was excommunicated, um, I think when he killed um, the Red Comet in the church. Yeah, that was when he was excommunicated. Uh, the Pope had recognized Edward I of England's claim to overlordship of Scotland in 1305, and Bruce was excommunicated by the Pope for murdering John Common before the altar in Great Friars Church in Dumfries in 1306. The Declaration made a number of much debated rhetorical points that Scotland had always been independent, indeed for longer than England, that Edward I of England had unjustly attacked Scotland and per per perpetrated atrocities, that Robert the Bruce had delivered the Scottish nation from this peril, and most controversially, that the independence of Scotland was the prerogative of the Scottish people rather than the King of Scots. The Scottish people rather than the King of Scots. In fact, it stated that the nobility would choose someone else to be king if Bruce proved to be unfit in maintaining Scots, Scotland's independence. Did you hear that? Yeah. Uh, some have interpreted this last point as an early expression of popular sovereignty. The government is contractual and the kings can be chosen by the community rather than by God alone. And actually, the original declaration is lost. There were three copies and there is this what's called the Tinningham copy of the declaration. It's got these cool little ragged ends. And <laughs> kind of, kind of, kind of, yeah. Anyway, um, one more note uh, before I put it. Although the English armies under Edward II were routed at Bannockburn in 1314, and by 1319, with the recapture of Berwick, effectively expelled from Scottish soil, they continued to mount attacks into Bruce and Scotland over succeeding years. And the Pope had not accepted the Scottish independence, perhaps partially because of the excommunication of, um, of Bruce, the killing common in the church. And that's why this Declaration of Arbroath was prepared as a formal, formal Declaration of Independence. It was drawn up in our Abbey, 1320, by a, um, a Bishop Linton, Bernard Linton, most likely, we feel, um, who, he was also the Chancellor of Scotland. And the Declaration urged the Pope to see things from a Scottish perspective, and not to take the English claim on Scotland seriously. It used strong words, indicating that with, without acceptance of the Scottish case, that the wars would continue, and the result of deaths would be the responsibility of the Pope. Now the Declaration itself, um, it first, it sets the will of the wishes of the people above the King. Though they were bound to him both by law and by his merits, it was so that their freedom might be maintained. If he betrayed them, he would be removed and replaced. This unique relationship of King and people would influence their history henceforward and would reach its climax in the Reformation in the century following, when the People's Church would declare and maintain its superiority over earthly crowns. And I can go on and on and all that, but I'm going to read most, or a good chunk of the Declaration. It's not too bad. Um, <laughs> and I did find on this computer site, you're not supposed to eat bananas because they, they add weight to you. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Hercules 
and dwelt for a long course of time in Spain among the most savage of tribes. Maybe that's where we picked it up. <laughs> but nowhere could they be subdued by any race, however barbarous. Thence they came 1,200 years after the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea to their home in the West, where they still live today. The Britons they first drove out. The Picts they utterly destroyed. And even though very often assailed by the Norwegians, the Danes, and the English, they took possession of that home with many victories and untold efforts. And as the histories of old time bear witness, they have held it free of all bondage ever since. In their kingdom, they have reigned 113 kings of their own royal stock, the line unbroken, a single foreigner. Sounds like the minion. Um, the most holy father, and it goes on, the most holy fathers, your predecessors, gave careful heed to these things and bestowed many favors and numerous privileges on the same kingdom and people as being the special charge of the blessed Peter's brother. Thus our nation, under the protection, did indeed live in freedom and peace up to the time when that mighty prince, the king of the English, Edward, the father of the one who reigns today, when our kingdom had no head and our people harbored no malice or treachery and were then unused to wars or invasions, came in the guise of a friend and ally to harass them as an enemy. The deeds of cruelty, massacre, violence, pillage, arson, imprisoning prelates, burning down monasteries, robbing and killing monks and nuns, and yet other outrages without number, which he committed against our people, sparing neither age nor sex, religion nor rank, no one could describe, nor fully imagine, unless he had seen them with his own eyes. But from these countless evils we have been set free, by the help of him who through his afflict, he who, though he afflicts, yet heals and restores, by our most tireless prince, king and lord, the Lord Robert, that's the Bruce, he that his people and his heritage might be delivered out of the hands of our enemies, met toil and fatigue, hunger and peril, like another Maccabeus or Joshua, and bore them cheerfully, him too, divine providence, his right of succession, according to or laws and customs which we shall maintain to the death and the due consent and asset of us all have made our prince and king to him as to the man by whom salvation has been wrought unto our people. We are bound both by law and by his merits, that our freedom may be still maintained. And by him, come what may, we mean to stand. Yet, if he should give up what he has begun and agree to make us or our kingdom subject to the king of England, or the English, we should exert ourselves at once to drive him out as our enemy and a subverter of his own rights and ours, and make some other man who was well able to defend us our king. For as long as but a hundred of us remain alive, never will we on any conditions be brought under English rule. And here's the part that's often quoted. It is in truth not for glory, nor riches, nor honors that we are fighting, but for freedom, for that alone, which no honest man gives up, but with life itself. Therefore it is I, Reverend Father and Lord, that we beseech your holiness with our most earnest prayers and supplicant hearts, in so much as you will in your sincerity and goodness consider all this, that since with him whose vice gen gerent on earth, you are there, is neither weighing the distinction of Jew, Greek, Scotsman, or Englishman. You will look with the eyes of a father on the troubles and privations brought by the English upon us and upon the Church of God. May it please you to admonish and exhort the King of English, who ought to be satisfied with what belongs to him, since English, England, used once to be enough for seven kings or more to leave us Scots in peace, who live in this poor little Scotland beyond which there is no dwelling place at all, and covet nothing but our own. And to conclude, we are, and that's what he says, to conclude, we are and shall ever be, as far as duty calls us, ready to do your will in all things, as obedient sons to you as his vicar, and to him as the supreme king and judge, we commit the maintenance of our cause, casting our cares upon him and firmly trusting that he will inspire us with courage and bring our enemies to naught. May the Most High preserve you to his holy church and holiness and health and grant you length of days. And given at the monastery of our growth in Scotland on the 
sixth day of the month of April in the year of grace, 1320, in the fifteenth year of the reign of our king aforesaid. And that was sent to the Pope, and he accepted the Scottish case. And as they say, the rest is history. <coughs> and now it's um, enough of me reading, but um, I believe Ed is going to come up, Ed Pierce, and take over and read some excerpts from the Scott Magazine, uh, Scott's Magazine article on Duncan McDonald, who is one of the reasons we're here today, actually. Ed? I wish you were here for us all to recognize Duncan McDonald.
district Titan. The district Titan is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Titans, I'm wearing a kilt, you know. But this is a McEwen Titan, my last name is Ewing. And, uh, and the uh, clan was called McEwen. And um, this is my Titan. And all, all the families have different ones. But initially, um, the original Titans were uh, district Titans. And they represented, um, you know, areas of the, uh, the, the country of Scotland, you know, different parts of Scotland. And um, I'm going to introduce you a little bit to the history of Tartans here. Um, the identification of Tartan with territory or place may be more ancient than its association with clan and family. In one of the earliest descriptions of the Highlanders, uh, M. Martin wrote, in the early 1600s. Every isle differs from each other in their fancy of making plaids, so as to the stripes and breadth and colors. The humor is as different through the main land of the highlands, in so far that they who have seen those places are able to first view of a man's plaid to guess the place of his residence. General Stuart Scarth, now unfortunately maligned advocate of the Highlanders, bridged the gap between the 18th and 19th centuries. A serving officer in the Black Watch, he knew men who lived during the 45 and the prescription of the time. In his classic sketches of the Highlanders, he wrote, in dyeing and coloring, and arranging the various colors of their times, they displayed no small art and taste preserving at the same time the distinctive patterns, or sets, as they were called, of the different clans, tribes, families, and districts. Thus, MacDonald, the Campbell, and Mackenzie, etc., etc., was known by his plaid, and in like manner, the Athol clan, Orkey, and other colors of diff dis different districts were easily recognized. It is reasonable to expect that residents of the same area use the product of local weavers. They in turn employed local dye stuffs and catered to local preferences in their weaving. Traces of this can still be seen today in that the majority of older clan times from the west of Scotland are predominantly variations in blue, black, and green. MacLeod, McNeil, MacDonald, McLean, and Campbell. A number of neighboring clans in the northeast use variations of the same pattern of black or dark blue stripes on a red ground, Macintosh, Robertson, Grant, McGilvery, Murray, and Drummond. If Tartan identification were primarily a, and Cynthia can help me with this word, Duthach, D-U-T-H-A-I-C-H, which means homeland, it should also be recognized that most people in isolated areas would also have been related by blood and marriage. And so the first recorded uniform Tartan is out of the Grants, when the laird of Grant ordered all eligible men spring when called for military action. It was a natural transition from identification with a place to that of service to the prominent family of the district. The hunting McPherson was earlier the Grey Plaid of Badenoch, and the Murray of Athol was first the Athol district. For, and for a further discussion and illustration of the district titans, this little thing I'm reading from says to refer to district titans by D. Gordon Teal, and Philip D. Smith. Remember that name, Philip D. Smith. And then remember this also, and it replies to people even from Cuttyhunk. Individuals with no clan or family type can and should be encouraged to wear a district type appropriate to a locale of origin, residence, or affection. The accompanying cap badge can be any with a Scottish theme, perhaps the cross of St. Andrews, a thistle, or the badge of a particular county or city. So in this list of district titans, and I don't know exactly when this was put together, but there's um, probably 40 of them there, we can add the, uh, the Martha's Vineyard district titan, which if you stay around long enough, you might get a chance to take a look at. And now the history of this. You know, there is a program that I'm supposed to be following. So I'm going to try to continue to do that. Um, the program says I'm supposed to be talking about the history of the Mayhew Stewart families. I, I got it. Thank you. I, I, have it, yeah. I, found, I found it. And, um, You know, as many things in the sky.
Scottish society, they, they, we all have our roots, you know, I've been getting into genealogy lately and I'm very keen on mine, but uh, the roots of a lot of the activities of this organization have sprung from the efforts of uh, Duncan MacDonald, who Ed uh, mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, we wish you were here today. Duncan, hello, if you see this. We love you and miss you. Anyway, this goes back to 2009, and if you remember when I read those resolutions, uh, the last one was in 2008. I, I bet you this is following in that suit. And this is from the designer of this district town from Cooksville, Tennessee. It reads, Dear Duncan, enclosed you will find two yards of machine woven Martha's Vineyard district town. It's actually written Martha Vineyard District slash Mayhew Town. It is yours to keep to show to the Chamber of Commerce and representatives of the Mayhew family. This is back in 09. As you know, I am a 12th generation descendant of Matthew Mayhew through his daughters. I envision this not only in, in this, this dear to our hearts also, souvenir skirts, trousers, kilts for the local pipe band, but also sashes, and bills of golf, or sailing caps, handbags, and whatever else one can think of to use as fabric to make money. Beach bags, shopping bags, etc. Please show this around and let me know what the leaders of various groups on the vineyard think. I hope this finds you well and at home for the summer season. Well, that was written to Duncan uh, back in 09. I had to give a talk at a, a, a group for a group um, that was looking at um, was, you know Scots on the Vineyard. It was the um, it was, it was the Center for Living, Martha Vineyard Center for Living. And I called uh, Kay Mayhew, uh, married to Donald Mayhew, who is uh, actually related to this Philip Smith back through the Stuarts. And um, what I'm going to give you is a little bit of early Scottish. Mayhew overlap history here. When I tried to get some information from her, uh, I'm going to just read you some, excuse me, some excerpts from some emails back and forth between the two of us. I've started emailing recently. Um, don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> anyway, she apologized for not calling. I have no help, you know, for you about the Scots, really. Duncan McDonald might have some ideas. I said, Okay, hi, Steve Ewing, thanks for getting back. I got hold of Duncan, and she gave me a copy of a time designed by a Dr. Philip Smith about 2009. He is the 11th or 12th, I'm not sure, descendant of Thomas Mayhew, paternal son. He has designed a beautiful Mayhew district time. He's designed over 100 times that Duncan believes the Scottish society should acknowledge and sanction him, hence us here today. Are the Mayhews Scottish, English, or both? This is my question. Can you help elucidate any of this? I need a month to digest, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, she writes back. This is Kay Mayhew, who also wanted to be here today with Donald, but she's previously engaged off island for Easter. Uh, the Mayhews are English, but thanks to a descendant, they now have a target. Uh, and then she's quoting from Banks, some of the history. Daniel Stewart, and he was the first one, was from Scotland. Came to the vineyard in 1680, from East Ham on the Cape. His daughter, Dorcas Stewart, is one of my husband Donald's ancestors and his reason for joining the Scottish Society. Dorcas married first a Philip Smith, perhaps connected with the time of Zion, which is true, as I'll, I'll speak to later. But Robert, another Scot, a couple more Scots here while I'm at it. Robert Cathart was a Scot who came to Tisbury in 1690. It is said he is probably the one who built Scotland Bridge in West Tisbury, though it appears in records as early as 1671, so perhaps another Scot built it. So we're not sure about that one. <laughs> James Claghorn was a Scottish prisoner sent to New England. His time was sold to Bernard Lombard of Barnstable before 1654. He retaliated on his master by taking his daughter Abiah as wife, January 1654, and they lived in Yarmouth. And then his wife committed suicide by hanging in 1677. And they were the ancestors of the Claghorn family on the island. And that's about the sum of her info on the early Scottish settlers. Interesting. 
bunch. <laughs> and uh, to continue on about Philip Smith and his connection here, um, uh, Phil Smith, Dr. Philip Smith, who is known internationally for his expertise in Titan design and research, has designed over 120 Titans, and is the author of more than 60 books on the subject, and has designed this um, Titan for us. He's a direct descendant of one of the original Vineyard settlers, John Smith, and is named for his son, Philip Smith, by reference to <coughs> who was Marshal of Duke's County. And then it mentions how Philip Smith uh, married Dorcas, daughter of Daniel Stewart, the Vineyard's original Scot, he's called transported to Massachusetts during the time of Cromwell, which was when my family actually came to Massachusetts too, from Scotland, uh, Scotland to Ireland. Dr. Smith's grandson is the ninth Philip Smith in 11 generations from John. And then to uh, read some more of this, this is from uh, Duncan's press release about the event today. Uh, Martha Vineyard had its own tartan, an attractive green and blue tartan with white and black poker stripes. Designed by Dr. Philip Smith, direct descendant of Governor Mayhew. Uh, presented as a district tartan representing the islands. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smith's great grandfather, Jeremiah, left the in 1867 to open a business in Montour, Iowa. As Smith explains it, they ran out of whales and invented coal oil. He numbers among his ancestors not only Governor Mayhew, but many early settlers, including John and his son Phil Smith, the Harlocks, the Stewarts, the Atherns, the Parkers, the Manters, and the Coffins. And here we go with Duncan again. Following a visit to Martha's Vineyard, sponsored by the Vineyard Scottish Society, at the invitation of Ms. Duncan MacDonald several years, several years ago, Dr. Smith decided to design a time a member of the Guild of Titan Scholars and a fellow of the uh, Society of Antiquities in Scotland, Dr. Smith, and noted researcher, et cetera, et cetera. Um, at this point, I'm also going to mention, I, I, I mentioned kind of some of the coloring of it, and I'm going to mention here what the, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to wait until I read the, um, the um, presentation of the grant of use. So that gives you, that sets the scene for the stage, I hope, for um, the next part of the afternoon, which is the piping in of the time. And I would like all of you, if you wish, whoever feels like they want to, to go into the back, right over there, and we're going to walk up here with the time and display it. So men in kilts and women in plaids or whoever wants to do it.
received such reverence. Trout turn from So, at this point, um, we're ready for the presentation of what's called the grant of use. And uh, I'd like to invite um, Art Smith to come up. Who's on the board of directors of the Scottish Society and find a place up here without knocking our illustrious banner over. And um, I'd like to read uh, this presentation of the grant of use, which was written, written to me as a past president of the Scottish Society of Martha's Vineyard um, by Dr. Smith, who designed the time.
set our hands and seals the 7th day of April, 2012. You are all here. Join me. Thank you.
one, so you can join in on the chorus or the verses or wherever you want. It's Bonnie Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond. Oh, okay. <laughs>